Well, it's so good to see everyone. You know, we're studying a, a book of Ephesians. We're going through it line by line, verse by verse, and we're continuing with that today. And the whole premise of the whole series is your identity leads to your destiny. Thinking rightly about yourself is so important. And so I want to encourage you with that, that how you think is so important. And so if we don't have the right type of thinking, we're not going to be able to do the life God's called us to become. And so that's why primarily the battle you and I face is in our minds, and the enemy wants to get us to believe the lies. And so Ephesians does a masterful job. The first three chapters talks about more like the theology of it, and then the last three chapters are more the practical expressions where we are right now. Last week we spoke about putting on and taking off, and today we're going to continue with that process but before we do that, I just want to remind everybody um, that your identity leads your destiny, and that's the whole purpose of this series. But uh, 78 years ago today, at 8.15 a.m., August 6, 1945, the world changed. Today, 78 years ago, Hiroshima in Japan took place. The first nuclear um, warhead was used in the area of war, first time. And if you're not familiar with what happened, we were in a war, World War II. We were fighting against Germany, and they were allies with, uh, with Japan. And, uh, and so there was a great race. Who's going to be the first one to harness nuclear power to make a, make, a, make a bomb? And so that's exactly what happened. They worked real hard on it, and they had the Manhattan Project, and et cetera. There's a movie out right now that's about that. So what happened, they were really working hard to get it, and, and we were hoping whoever got it first is going to win the war. But then uh, Hitler uh, died, and he committed suicide, and the war was over, but it wasn't really over yet because Japan didn't yet surrender. And so they were at a dilemma. What are we going to do? And as, as they thought about it, they understood the Japanese are tremendous warriors, and they're not going to give up. And so they made the fateful decision where the whole world changed, where a nuclear bomb was dropped in Hiroshima. And, and what happened was, this is before and this is after. Now, why am I talking about this for? Well, number one, it's the 70th anniversary. And also, there, there's something I wanted to, to help us to understand in regards to how we are to act with what we do. God has given us great power and great resources. And how we handle it determines how we're going to live our lives, which I'll share in a few moments. So this is what took place. And then a few days, and this is the aftermath. Uh, it was unbelievable. And, uh, and then a couple days after, on August 9th, 1945, 5, 1102, there was Nagasaki, Japan that took place. So uh, the world changed. But the, why am I bringing this up for? Well, you can use nuclear power for something good or something bad, right? And God has given us gifts. We can use it for good and bad. And God has us here to make a difference in the world. And I just wanted to, uh, this is the nuclear power, and I just wanted to, talk to you a little bit about, like, I'm not a physicist, but I'm going to try my best, all right? But uh, very interesting, I don't know if you recognize this, there's this fission and this fusion, and, uh, and what you can do with nuclear bombs is what they do is they split the atoms and it, it grows, and, and what happens, unfortunately, with nuclear, uh, nuclear power is sometimes there's waste. You have to get rid of that radioactive waste, and it's going to be a little bit dangerous, and et cetera, et cetera. We had uh, Three Mile Island that took place. We had what happened in Chernobyl, so people are scared of it. But now the scientists are working on something called fusion. They haven't mastered it yet. And what's interesting is what's happening with fusion, instead of the atoms splitting and creating, a, creating, if you will, fallout, this is a different and even cleaner energy. What happens is the molecules join together, and it becomes a great power source that we have not quite harnessed yet, but they're believing in the next 15, 20 years, Lord willing, we're going to have endless supply of energy. Think about that. And, and also, we're able to now take salt water out of the ocean, desalination. And so, but those two combined, it's amazing what can happen if we don't kill ourselves first. Now, what does this have to do with uh, Ephesians? Well, the point I'm trying to bring to you is often you and I, when we get angry, we react. I call it a reactor. Wouldn't you rather respond and think and clearly think? And so we have an opportunity to use gifts that God has given us. Anger can be a great catalyst to change things. In fact, in many ways, because God so loved the world that he sent Christ. 
And God was angry at sin. He was so angry at sin that he sent Jesus to take all the weight and all the anger and all the wrath and all the destruction of sin of, and placed it upon Jesus willing, voluntarily. He did this. So you and I could be free and not have a fallout in us instead of have a fallout of grace. And so, you see, sin matters to God. It's so destructive. It's so radioactive. It destroys that God had to send Jesus to take our place, that if we give our lives to Christ. So what I'm saying about all that is, is simply this. I don't want to be a person that divides and gives a lot of fallout. I'd rather be like fusion that joins two more together and gets larger. I don't know if you understand what I'm trying to say. I'll try to be a better job at it. So we have fission right now. This is nuclear power we have right now, and it's very clean. It's very good, but there's fallout. There is radioactive material. It's hard to get rid of. It's hard to deal with. Or you can do fusion where it is a lot cleaner and more powerful, and instead of subtracting and, and splitting, it actually adds on to each other. Now, what do I say that for? The Bible says this, be angry and do not sin. A lot of folks are afraid to get angry. And anger is a very, very volatile thing, isn't it? Uh, be angry and do not sin. So being angry is not a sin. What is a sin is sin, <laughs> doing the wrong thing with the anger. Now, anger is a tremendous catalyst, almost like adrenaline. And sometimes if there's adrenaline, I've heard stories of people lifting cars off of somebody because adrenaline kicks in. They have supernatural strength, if you will. It's something that God has given us for certain stances, and they can lift a car or do something tremendous. In many ways, anger is like adrenaline. It's supposed to be a catalyst for us to make a change. And you can see it that Jesus even got angry. One day he was trying to heal on the Sabbath, a man had a withered hand, and he looked at the Pharisees. They were trying to trap Jesus. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And Jesus says, be made whole. And he put his hand out, and they were upset because he healed on the Sabbath. And he, the Bible says he was angry. And, of course, we know what happens. If you're not familiar with the story, Jesus goes to the temple, and he sees what's going, the buying and the selling, and, and basically taking advantage of people. And he goes so upset that they made it a house of robbers, that Jesus turned over the tables. He was angry. He was angry. And that anger helped him to do the right thing. The Bible says the wrath of God is against all ungodliness. You see, God does not want to see the destruction that is going on. Right now, what he's doing, he's being very patient. He wants none to perish, according to 1 Peter. He wants none to perish. He's giving an opportunity. So what I'm trying to mention to you today is that we are to be angry. Angry should be something that we use as a catalyst, but you can't live on adrenaline. You can't live on anger. So the Bible says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. So often anger is a response. We're living in a very angry culture today, are we not? There's a lot of anger out there. And anger usually is a sign of something going wrong. Uh, imagine, if you will, you're driving your car, and I'm sure this happened to nobody, and all of a sudden it, the gas light goes on saying you need, to get, you need to get gas. That never happened to anyone, right? How many of you have ever been left with the car and you had to go someplace and they left the tank on empty? I don't know who does that. I'm not going to mention any names, but it does happen. And of course, me being a loving uh, person in the house, I'd say, well, listen, next time that happens, do me a favor. Could you please let me know? I'll be happy to fill up the tank and make sure that you don't have to do it. And that's how I always respond. <laughs> it's my honor and privilege to get my hands full of gasoline for you. But no, what normally happens, right? We get upset. We react to it. Well, in many ways, when you and I have anger, usually there's something wrong. It's not the gas gauge that's the problem. The problem is the tank is unempty. And so when you and I feel betrayed, when you and I feel we're taken advantage of, we have anger comes out of us, right? It's a response. It's a mechanism of protection. We feel we're put upon. We're, we're hurt in some way, so we got to respond. And so anger is a, a mechanism to protect. Now, what's the difference between righteous anger... And godly anger, righteous anger, and worldly anger, and fleshly anger. Well, in many ways, think about it. Most of the time, when it's, when it's of the flesh, it's about me, me, me. But, you know, we should get angry at what we see going on in our culture today. We should get angry when we see people mistreated. 
And we should do everything in our power to use it as a catalyst, but we are not to sin. Because, you know, very, very interesting that anger is one letter short of danger. So we have to be extremely careful when we get angry. And so in this whole passage today, I'm starting off with that because I'm just thinking about that is a very palpable emotion that a lot of us face and we go through, we get angry, and, and, but the Bible says, get angry, do not sin. And so we should use our emotions to do something well. Now, I want to give you an antidote of how to help ourselves to make sure that our anger is righteous and not unrighteous and that everything that we're doing is, is actually helpful instead of hurtful. And, and there's a key component here you're going to see today. We're going to share it in a few moments. Where I, don't want to, I want to be about fusion, not fission. Remember, fission is there when we, the atoms, uh, when we have nuclear energy, and it's, it's good and everything, but there's too much of a fallout. While fusion, they're claiming, from what I understand, it's going to be a much cleaner and, and, and everlasting, if you will, not everlasting, but a um, never-ending source of energy. And how that happens is the molecules come together and they get larger rather than splitting and making explosions. A lot of us, we see a lot of splitting going around in our country and explosions of families, of relationships. So we want to be better than this. So I just want to rehearse a little bit what happened last week. We spoke last week about this. We mentioned this. Rather, we are speaking the truth in love. A couple weeks ago, rather, speaking the truth in love. We are to grow up in every way. So we want to speak the truth in love and grow up in every way in a Christ. The whole body is joined and equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. God wants us to be a biblically functioning community that we're better together than without each other, that we're working together, not dividing and exploding. We want to work together and become better and not have fallout, but have greater strength rather than have the world's way of doing things. Now, we mentioned last week how to put on Christ. We have to take off the old first, but that's not good enough just to take off. Because if you take off, you're left with something void. And it's very easy to try to, to put something else on instead. So the Bible says take off and put on Christ. So we want to take off anger and put on love. Take off hostility, put on benevolence. So we want to take off and put on. Take off and put on. That every day, you and I, I, I get soiled clothes every day. And we want to put on Christ instead. So we talk about this. Don't stop, but replace. To try to stop doing something is very difficult. It's much better to replace instead. Instead of stop trying to be angry, start being loving. As I mentioned last week, we had a friend of ours in the church that had a hard time smoking. And so he's, he's replaced smoking with chewing gum. Okay, we, there's better examples, but that's what we talked about last week. So we're going back to today. In Ephesians 4.15, it says this. Put off your old self. Put off your old self. You are a child of God. You don't have to live in the old way, which belongs to your former manner of life and corrupt through his deceitful desires and be renewed in the spirit of your minds. Remember, everybody, how you think controls your life. That's why what you think about your identity leads you to your destiny. So we want to have the right thinking about how we're supposed to live. And the Apostle Paul is making it abundantly clear how we're supposed to do that, that we are the spirit of your minds and to put on the new dog. Take off and put on. Take off and put on. Every day, we want to take off the old man and put on the new in the spirit. Created after the likeness of God to righteousness and holiness. Therefore, here's today, therefore, what does therefore mean? What is it there for? Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. So one of the ways we get healthy is we have to what? Put off falsehood and speak the truth with our neighbor. You know, I, I find it very interesting that truth is very important in a body. For example, if, I, if, if, I, if I'm touching something extremely hot and my hand lies to my mind, says it's not hot, and it's burning, I'll destroy my hand. So it's very important the body speaks to each other to protect itself. I'm afraid a lot of us are living these lives today. We're isolated. 
When's the last time someone told you something in love that you had to change? Do we have those kind of relationships? Do we have relationships saying you're going the right direction, you're doing well, or listen, you need to have a course correction, or you're going to burn your hand, I care about you. And what happens is we're afraid to do that. And the only way we're going to be really healthy and and make a difference is the body works together, but the body has to be connected, and the body has to be willing to speak the truth in love. You see that? Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another, but we are to speak the truth in love. And so I want to encourage you that do you have anyone? When's the last time someone said something to you? I can't think of a last time, except for my wife or my husband. I can't think of a last time. Could it be? One reason is you're too isolated, or number two, You're too volatile. You're too reactive. You react to everything. You explode or you either implode where it's passive aggressive or you explode. So like, you know what? I'm not going to tell this person. They're not going to listen anyhow, so why waste my time? That's very frustrating. I I have people like that in my life. I I, I wish I could say something to them, but I can't because if I say something to them, they're going to implode or explode. And I'm like, I'm not going to waste my mind. And as a result, the person has to live in this way and not advance. So one of the things we're trying to build in our culture here is that you know, we, we say, listen, go, feel free to speak to me. If something troubles you, and so we have a, uh, we, we'll tell each other something. He said, listen, it's so much better that we are honest. The Bible says faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are profuse. So we are to speak the truth to each other. But truth does not mean rude. <laughs> I just speak it like it is. No, no, no. No, think before you speak. Think before you speak. Is it going to build someone up? Is it going to make them better? We have to do it in a productive and proactive way, which brings health and healing to build up, not to destroy. If you release too much medication on a situation, you can overdose and kill somebody. That same medication that can heal can kill through overdose. And sometimes in anger and not being careful, we overdose it. Instead of being a source of blessing, truth becomes a curse. So we have to measure out the medication, the medication of what we're telling someone in the right manner, in the right way, so it would be ingested and bring healing. And this is all part of the process we're after. So I want to get back to anger again, which we started with, because this is something I think a lot of us are facing right now. There's a lot of anger. And I wish I could say that I beat this and I'm good, I'm fine. I'm not. I'm working on it. I'm a lot better than I used to be. I'm Italian. (laughs) Passionate, right? And I'm German. I think of ways to get you. (laughs) So, man, you put those two together, you got got some trouble. But has this ever happened to you? A number of years ago, there was somebody that, I'm kind of ashamed, but there was a situation where there was a, um, a person, a customer service person, was not doing very good customer service. And I completely lost it. I got so agitated, told the person off, I act like a complete idiot. And I felt so bad. I'm like, God, what is wrong with me? How could I do that? I, I, I just let a little, you know what I'm saying, everybody? You know what I'm talking about? Like someone cuts you off and you just want to say, you just want to say hey, move. And, and, and you open the door just a little bit. And you ever, do you ever open the door of a car on a windy day? right? It used to open. That's how anger can happen. And I was so ashamed of myself. And then I used to think that anger was bad. No, anger can be a good catalyst. So be angry and do not sin. And that's the hard part, everybody. There's righteous anger, and righteous anger does not mean you're loud and you tell people the truth. You have to do it in a way that is humble, right? Be angry, do not sin. Now, do not let the sun go down on your anger and... Give the opportunity to the devil. So this happens a lot. And, and so I'm married, and Sandra and I, we've been married many years now. Not many years, but compared to my parents, who are like 63. Uh, we're married uh, 22 years now. Or 20... <laughs> okay, well, I'll look at it next time. <laughs> no, we're 23 years. 23 years. I'm so good at math. Uh, but anyhow, so I, I made it my, my priority. We're not going to... We're going to settle this issue. We're not going to let the sun settle on our anger. 
And so I heard of a man that did the same thing. He said, oh, my wife and I, we never let the sun settle on our anger. And one, one night we were going long into the night. And finally she came to me in her hands and knees, crawling to me, looked under the bed and said, get out and fight like a man, you wimp. <laughs> so, so Sandra and I, we, I used to try to finish it, and then what happened was we got more and more tired, and we, we got more and more dis disagreements, and it got worse and worse and worse. I'm like, I guess the Bible doesn't work, and then I realized, wait a minute here. Honey, I love you. You love me. We're a happy family. And we start jumping around like Barney, and then we went to bed. And then the following day, let's deal with it. But the bottom line is don't let a day go by without settling issues. Because if we don't deal with anger, anger will deal with us. And don't let the sun settle on your anger. What happens is, we'll, we'll get into this later, a root of bitterness begins to come down. And then once that root of bitterness goes down, it begins to grow tentacles. And then you pull it out thinking, I'm not angry anymore, but you don't recognize because that bitterness got there, it starts growing up, starts popping up. Pop, 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 like the, the, the weeds in the grass that are driving me crazy, okay? That's what happens. you got to pull and extract that thing immediately or it will grow legs and grow. So be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun settle in your anger. So I'm, I'm happy to say that we made it a priority in our relationship that we deal with stuff daily. We do. I, 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 I can't think of ever that we let a day go by. One time, maybe 26 hours went by, and I was beside myself. We got to settle this, honey, and we settle it. We settle it, even say, I am sorry. And it really helps our relationship. But some of you, you haven't, you have bitterness about 20 years ago or 20 days ago, and you have it festering. Some of you haven't talked to your parents or your brother or your sister, and you have all this bitterness, and you have ulcers, and you're frustrated, and you have anger, you're angry at everybody, you explode, you don't know what's going on. It's because something is hurt in you. So the Bible says, don't give the devil an opportunity. Be angry. Well, he gets in there. That's right. You give, him a, a, you give him a door, he'll open it up, and he'll come on in. And that bitterness will take root in you. It's like a roach that comes into your house, and one roach will multiply. If you see one, you've got a whole, lot, whole bunch. And if you don't deal with it immediately and deal with it succinctly, you're going to have problems. That's what the Bible says. Do not let the sun settle on your anger and give opportunity to the devil. So that's obviously in marriage is a big one, but also among each other. We can't let that anger take control of us. The anger should be a catalyst. You can say, you know what? And this is good. Do this. Tell somebody, you make me angry. Don't say that. <laughs> or this one. What's the matter? Nothing. <laughs> How you doing? Fine. I'm fine. <laughs> no. When you're angry, something's going wrong. If you are like, if you try, there's two different philosophies of that. One philosophy is just get rid of anger altogether. That's not good. That's not biblical. The ancient Greeks had a couple of philosophies, the Epicureans and the Stoics. And so one, one would say, uh, get rid of it all. The other one is like, well, obviously something's going on for fully express yourself. Either is not good. What we want to do is take responsibility for the anger and say, tell somebody, when you do this, I get angry. You don't make me angry. I get angry when you're late to dinner. I get angry when you do this. Take responsibility for it. It's good to share with someone how you feel, right? But we got to do it responsibly. You, you guys follow what I'm saying? So we want to speak, don't be angry, do not sin, and do not give the devil an opportunity to the devil, and the devil will take an opportunity. And anger is a huge, huge thing that he does. In fact, a lot of crime is domestic. And there's a lot of anger going on today. And now, how do we beat anger down? How do we, how do we overcome anger? We overcome it with love, obviously, but we're going to share with you, uh, I believe, a uh, one of the antidotes against it. Know this, my beloved, it says in the book of James. Let every person be what? Quick to hear. Quick to hear. Man, that's tough, right? I mean, we got to practice this. I, I, maybe I've done this. You ever get in a conversation with somebody, you keep interrupting them? Sandra would go, you keep interrupting. I'm like, sorry, honey. Listen. Listen to what the person is saying. And so when we get angry, we often don't listen. We want to fight back. So the Bible says, uh, Every person, look at your neighbor and say, you're an every person. And tell them, I'm a someone. Be stop it. Okay. 
Let every person be what? Quick to hear. So I want to, I'm going to stop trying to fight back. I'm going to listen. Most of our disagreements and most of our arguments are over misunderstandings. Really are. Most of them are. And we will follow the Matthew 18 process of going to our brother or sister first, right? Making it right between it. If it doesn't work, take someone else with you to clarify. And if it still happens, then that's a whole other topic for another place. But we want to be quick to hear, slow to speak. (laughs) Or slow to anger. See how that works? So the Bible is very clear about that. We don't want to get the devil an enemy. And our mouth, man, it's hard to control. The Bible says in the book of James, if, if someone can control their mouth, they can control every part of their life. And well, you say, well, I never talk. Yeah, but self-talk, right? If we can control what we speak, and the enemy tries to get us to say things, as he knows his power in the spoken word. So anyhow, so be quick to hear and slow to speak and slow to anger for the anger of man. The anger of man Produces the, does not produce the righteousness of God. But godly anger is fine. But the anger of men. So we should be angry when we see people going the wrong direction. I don't want to be angry at the people. I want to be angry at the sin, right? I want to be angry what's taking place. People are getting hurt. We have to get the truth out there. We have to protect people. And we have to have a different mindset. But it's so hard for us not to run into the flesh. And that's, again, we could spend weeks upon this topic alone. And then we go on, for the anger of man, we go on back to Ephesians, let the thief no longer steal. Now, I'm going to show you something here. I believe this is one of the ways we get rid of anger. Let the thief no longer steal. Well, I'm not a thief. I understand that. But rather, let him labor doing honest work with his hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. So here's a principle here. Don't steal. Obviously, it means that. But also, I think metaphorically speaking as well, that we either are givers or we're takers. Am I trying to extract something out of you? Am I trying to win an argument? Am I trying to get um, acceptance from you? Am I trying to find purpose in your life? We don't want to be that way. There's two main types of people. There are givers and they're takers. Which one do you want to be? Right now, we're living in a culture. It's about taking. You did me wrong. You owe me. You owe me. You owe me. You owe me, right? You owe me for this. You owe me for that. Well, when you do that, then I'll do this. When you do that, then I'll do this. And we have this owing. We're, we're like collection agencies. I'm not going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to take away what you have until you pay me back. So we have givers and takers. And you know what God's called us to be? It's more blessed to what? Give than receive. So this happens in everything. Man, let me tell you how wonderful this is when we become the being givers instead of than takers. I want to be a giver and a receiver versus a taker. Now, what is give and receive versus give and take? Let let me say that. A giver will give something, right? I'm going to give something to you whether you give it to me back or not. I'm going to give it to you, owe me nothing. I want to be a blessing to you. Versus if you go into a party, you go someplace, I want to talk to this person. I want to get something out of the person. And we do it all the time. We're insecure. We don't feel we're good enough. And so we're we're talking to someone. We're sizing them up. Are Are they better than I am? Are they smarter than I am? They make more money than I did. They have better vacations than I. Oh, they're better than this and better than that. And we begin to size someone up. We compare ourselves. We get kind of defensive and, and we're not really listening anymore. And we, we want to take from the conversation. What would happen if we just put that all away and say, God, I want to be a blessing. I want to give to this person. Because this person has a, this person is going through something I know nothing about. It's fighting a battle I know nothing about. And I can learn something from this person. Let me just listen to this person. And let me try to give my time, give my attention, hear from God, and bless them. What would happen? First of all, your anxiety level would go way down. Wouldn't it be nice not to compete with each other anymore? Wouldn't it be nice to, to look on Facebook or Instagram and be happy that someone is doing phenomenal? Right? So there's givers and there's takers. And so when I give, it's like you have two leeches together to suck each other dry. But when you give blessing... And then you give me blessing, what happens? It multiplies. That's what, the, that's, what the, that's what God does. All relationships come from God, and God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It's like a never ending relationship of, of expansion of God's love. So I give to you, you give to me. I had a friend of mine, an older man said to me, um, who I bought an engagement ring from, he said, Listen, there's two people you can't outgive. You can't outgive God, and you can't outgive your wife. 
And you know what? He's absolutely correct. I'm just speaking for me. But anytime I try to bless Sandra, she blesses me back more. I can't outgive her. I try, and I can't. I can't outgive God. When I give love to her and give care to her, and I do it not because of me, I get more back. It's just so much better. So I want to give, and I want to receive with thanksgiving. I want to give. I want to receive with thanksgiving. Versus mine, 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 mine. There, there's, there's an old Chinese proverb, and you might have heard it before, but it's so good I need to say it again. There was this person that saw two places. They saw a heaven and a hell. Again, this is a, an illustration. It's not true. Okay, so don't say, okay. So they, they smelt this beautiful food, and they went, and they went to this place, and, and they saw the beautiful food, but they heard these cries of anguish, of, of screaming. It was a horrific, hellish sound. And they went, and they saw people at a banquet table, and they had chopsticks as arms, and they were trying to feed themselves, and they were all starving. They were living skeletons that had all the food there, but they could not feed themselves. And then the person was taken to another place. Same exact smell, but instead there was laughter, joy, beautiful, and they saw each other feeding each other with their chopstick arms that I'm giving you my food, you're giving it to me. This is the kind of people God wants us to become. We should be givers, not takers. When we have that mindset, anger goes down because you're not trying to owe something anymore. It says, owe nothing to anyone except for your what? Obligation to what? I love, and the word there for in the Greek is agape, which love without strings, love one another. If you love your neighbor, you will fulfill the requirements of God's law. So how most simple, rather than try to keep this huge book of do's and do nots, do you realize most of our problems, most of our anxieties, most of our frustrations, most of our depression would go away if we would just bless each other and look to help each other and be a blessing rather than take it from each other? If we had that mindset, most of our relationships would get healed. And if they don't respond well, you're, not gonna, you're gonna be off the hook because you're loving like God loved. In Acts, uh, it says this it says, Jesus said, It's more blessed to give than to receive. And I have been a constant example, the Apostle Paul talks in the book of Acts, of how you can help those in need by working hard. You should remember the words of our Lord Jesus it's more blessed to give than to receive. And then we go to verse 29. Of Ephesians. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth. Corrupting means rotting. It's like, like a rotting corpse. It's like a rotting fruit. Don't let rotten um, things come out of your mouth. It's so easy. Is it not easy, everybody? I mean, you know, and when I was a kid, uh, young pubescent, I, I learned how to swear because I was trying to be cool. And to this day, once in a while, I have to watch out because it might come out. And I'm, going, I'm bringing it before the Lord. I'm just being honest with you. Okay? I'll say gosh darn once in a while. No, I'm just kidding. But seriously, sometimes I have to be careful because I learned it as a kid. And, and, and even hearing it once, I have to be very careful with my mouth. I give my mouth to the Lord. I don't want to be swearing. Right? But it isn't just swearing. It's saying nasty things to each other. Saying hurtful things to each other. And so no, no corrupting talk, speaking bad, corrupting, or talking about someone and talking about how they're not good, or did you hear about this person? Did you hear about the other person? Yeah, guess what this person's doing? And we just sit there, and we'll, all we do is stir up negativity. Negativity, that invites the enemy. See, no corrupting talk out of your mouth, but only what is good for building up. We should be building each other up. Any fool can criticize. Any idiot, I'm sorry, I'll say it. Any idiot can be a jerk. You, you said something un unpleasant. Well, it's true. How about we try to find ways to bless each other? How about instead of trying to find something wrong, we speak good of each other? Speak good of each other. So find a good, right? How about we, you know, with our, with our kids, we do it. Man, it's, when you're parenting, it's tough sometimes. You idiot, you're always late. You never amount to anything. Maybe you've been told that as a child, right? I, I heard a story not too long ago of, uh, of a woman and a husband that got married within, within eight months of their marriage, they got an argument. And the woman told the man, I wish I never met you that day at that party. My life would be so much better if we never got married. Boom. And five years go by, their marriage is struggling, and they go to a counselor and they find out that's what she said. She says, I didn't mean that. We be very careful with our words. I heard a story of a man that told his friend, he says, 
He says, I'm sorry I hurt you. He says, that's okay. That's what I want you to do. I want you to take feathers, and I want you to take these feathers, a whole package of them. I want you to put them every doorstep of this town. So he said, I did that. He did it. He said, now go back and collect those feathers. You can't. We have to be very careful what we say. That's why we need each other. That's why we have to be careful what we say. Let no corrupting cock come out of your mouth, but only what is good for building up as it fit the occasion, that it may give grace to those. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit. We're actually grieving the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit gives us strength. The Holy Spirit gives us power, right? The Holy Spirit is a person of God. And so what happens, it, it, the Holy Spirit is often illustrated as a dove because it comes gently, and at least gently. That's why in the book of, Sam, uh, the book of uh, Judges, for example, there's a man by the name of Samson, and the Bible says the Spirit of God left him, but he didn't know it. We have to be very careful. I, want this, I don't know about you, not by my, not by power, but by my Spirit. I need the Holy Spirit. So do you. We don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. We want to invite the Holy Spirit. We want his power to flow through us, right, and in us. So, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. You're sealed by the Holy Spirit. Let all what? Bitterness. What's bitterness? Unresolved anger. It gets down there. It starts growing roots. Let all bitterness and wrath. Wrath is explosion of anger. And clamor, which is like a fighting, and slander. Slander's taking words and just twisting it and just taking that knife. And I, I'm going to cut you and dice you. Be put away from you along with all malice, planning to do something bad. What are we to do? Be what? Kind. kind. Be kind to one another. Tenderhearted. You see, when you do all these things, what happens? You get hardened. What does it say? Forgiving one another. This is how we stay free. So are you a giver or are you a taker? Are you going to be a person that's fusion or fission? Where there's like, there's radioactive leftovers. Or do you want to have something that's going to give? And how do we become a fusion of love as we gather together? We love each other. We give to each other. We don't extract and take. We give to each other and we continue to grow. And this is what God would have us to do. Be kind to one another. Forgiving one another as what? When she, then I. Well, I'm going to say something that's not going to be very popular. It's a little sexist. People say, you're being sexist, Pastor. No, I'm not being sexist. I'm being biblical. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, which we're going to get into later on, it says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. So who's the first person that should try to heal a relationship in a marriage? The man, the husband. That's sexist. No, it's biblical because we're supposed to be Christ in the relationship. Now, the women still have a responsibility. Don't get me wrong. But men, we have to start manning up and taking ownership of what God has put us. If you're married, right? This is for everyone. Men, you're supposed to be Christ. You know what the Bible says? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So we're going to be like Christ. You need to bring healing before she does or he does. We need to be people, men. We need to be real men. Real men forgive. Real men forgive like Christ forgave. Real men get angry at injustice and bring healing in godly grace. And so men, that, we're getting more of this later on, but we should do that. And so maybe some of you are going through that today as we prepare ourselves for communion. If you'd like to get a communion element, just go to raise your hand and one of the ushers will give them to you. If you've given your life to Jesus Christ and you're a believer and you're not holding unforgiveness towards anyone, we, we welcome you to join in with this. We get ready. But be kind to one another, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. As God in Christ forgave you. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as Christ forgave you. What would happen if you got what you deserved? I heard a pastor say this a number of years ago. I'll never forget it. That's what he said. If we all got what we deserved, we should all be taken outside and shot. Whoa. Sounds like Joseph Stalin. No, but the truth of the matter is there's not one that's righteous. No, not one. It's only because of what Christ, God hates sin. His anger burns against sin. He hates sin so much that he sent Jesus 
so he could hate sin away by the love of Christ. This is what I want to encourage you with today. I want to encourage you with this today. In fact, forgiveness, Corey Tamboon said this, forgiveness is to set a prisoner free and to realize a prisoner was you. Jesus gave an illustration of a man that owed a lot of money, millions of dollars. And the man said, please forgive me, I'll pay it back. The guy could never pay it back. But the king had compassion, so he let him go. Then the man grabbed a friend of his that owed him a week's salary and choked him, said, pay me back. When the king heard about it, he said, I forgave you, and you can't forgive him. Hand him over to the torturers until he pays every last cent. And what forgiveness does, it sets you free. Never means that you have to go for abuse. God never calls it to be abused, but we are to get rid of the toxins of unforgiveness. I've mentioned it all the time. Why am I repeating? Because it's an issue that you and I constantly deal with. You're not designed psychologically or physiologically to handle the emotion of unforgiveness. It will destroy you. It's not good for your health. And Jesus loves you so much that he forgave you. So we are to forgive each other. There's only one thing evil cannot stand, and that is forgiveness. That was the arsenal that Jesus dropped on the world. You talk about a nuclear weapon? This was the greatest weapon ever. It's the love of Jesus. When Jesus died on the cross for us, love conquered wickedness. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I pray right now that all of us in this room would examine ourselves, Jesus. I pray there's anyone here right now that has not given their life to you and not allowed you to be their Lord and Savior. I pray right now you bring conviction upon anyone right now in Jesus' name. And just with every head bowed and every eye closed, let me ask you a question. If you were to die today, do you absolutely, positively know you'd be with God in heaven? I can honestly tell you, I know. And if you, if you hear in your mind, well, compared to other people, that doesn't cut it. There's not one that's righteous. No, not one. All have sinned. All have turned away. There's only one name on which we can be saved. It's through Jesus Christ. You must believe he died on the cross and rose again from the dead and be willing to step down from being in charge of your life and say, I give my life to you. With every head bowed and every eye closed, let me ask you a quick question. How many say, Pastor, please include me in a prayer today. I want to give my life to Christ. I've fallen away, and I want to get right, or I've never given my life. But today, I want to give my life to Christ. Real, real quick, on the count of three. One, two, three. Lift your hands up if that's you. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Anyone else today? Listen, we're all family here. Let's pray this prayer in our hearts. Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross and rose again from the dead. Today, I step out. I step down from being in charge of my life. I give my life to you. Take my life. It is yours. I ask you to forgive me now of all of my sins, both known and unknown. And with your help, I choose to follow you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, there's...